Hey guys, how everybody, how's everybody doing? Um, it's December 9th, probably early in the morning, um, but wanted to get this Bible study out as I've been instructed to do so. Um, today, as you saw the title, this Bible study is called The Patient Husbandman. And of course, if people don't know who or what the husbandman is or what that means, it means pretty much a gardener, a farmer. And um, back in, way back in the Hebrew times, they used to call, you know, a farmer or a vine dresser, a husbandman. Um, even Cain was called a husbandman because he tilled to the ground. Um, but in this Bible study, we're gonna be in James 5, 7. Um, that's where we're gonna start. And I have about maybe four to five scriptures or that God has you know, elaborated on things about. So um, as we get started and you get some coffee, do what you gotta do. Um, but we're gonna get right to it. So, through all these Bible studies, God is creating this theme of bearing fruit and in multiple different ways and in different um, environments that people may not think God wants to bear them, have to be used to bear fruit in. Um, through my studies and where God's been taking me, he's only elaborating even more and more what he's seeing and how he's using all of us already and will use us soon. So. As always with these Bible studies, take them to God. Um, everything stated, please take it to the Lord for your own walk with him. Um, this is your relationship with God too. So um, make sure that everything you receive, everything you eat from the fruit bared here is presented to him to further along your own path with him um, in Jesus name. So in James 5, 7, um, I'm gonna read the scriptures he led and just go off all the elaboration he gave to me in my notes. So some of these scriptures are gonna be, I'm gonna sit on them for a minute, some of them I won't, but it's all good, we're just gonna flow through it, all right? So in James 5, 7, on verse seven, it says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Of course, this scripture, um, we have read this many times where God is returning and he's waiting to see if there is the fruit yielded that he's expected, right? Um, in another layer, God showed me that this is not just the return of the Lord, but this as him already with us now, um, in spirit in our lives, God is also patient, not just for this type of harvest, which is prophetic, but a type of harvest that is now, that is happening. So in my notes, I put that Jesus is patient for the whole harvest, of course, the early and latter rains. Um, but what this means is for you and us who are in a way like a tree who bear fruit of him, because um, he's our source, there's times where he is waiting for the whole basket of fruit, meaning that he is waiting for the alpha and omega of your season of fruit being bared. Um, we, who see, we who have you know very limited sight into things to come, see fruit as it's being birthed, right? We don't get to see the fruit that we're going to bear two or three days from now, 15 days from now. We don't see that, but God does. Um, many times when we're bearing fruit, it's like, oh, I bear fruit of the Lord. Okay, great. Maybe that's all he wants to do. God has a grander plan where he says, this is just one yield of you. You know how a tree can yield multiple fruits in one season, as long as the environment and everything is correct. That's also the layer that the Lord has taken me in on this study as well. He's shown me that God is waiting for the full yield of your full season. He's waiting for the full yield of your season. Meaning not just if you're in a season where you're just bearing fruit or you're doing this, um, you're being used by God in a way. He's waiting for the beginning and end of that. He is patient throughout all of it. Okay. In the verse eight, it talks about be ye also patient, 
and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Of course, we understand where it says, be ye also patient, because he's moving and manifesting through us, right? Further in my notes, I put, since God is waiting for the full yield of your fruit, the whole season, the whole basket of fruit, like in Thanksgiving or Christmas, that whole basket of all the different flavors. Remember, even if you're a tree, yes, which we are, we can bear fruit of multiple different flavors. Think about when God says, you're, uh, Israel is the apple of mine eye. But think about how many flavors of apples you can have. I remember in one Bible study I mentioned before, there's Granny Smith apples, there's Macintosh apples, there's red apples, there's yellow apples. It goes, the list goes on and on. Okay. So God is waiting for the full basket of your fruit. The, all the flavors that he has ordained, positioned you and me to bear the specific colors, flavors to the people who it needs to be. Sometimes we're in seasons that seem to go on forever. And sometimes these seasons that go on forever are only because God is being that much more patient and that God is wanting the fullness of your, your fruit. He's not wanting 80%. He's not wanting 90%. He's wanting the 100% that he knows that he's going to use you for. The one, the thing he's expecting to see out of you is his expectation out of you. He's waiting to complete because he knows what all that fruit is going to yield to who is going to be eaten by, how it's going to touch everybody, the whole master plan that God has for you. So it is our job through, it's our perspective to see God's perspective. It's our job to see that during these, these seasons of bearing fruit, these seasons that we're in, we need to be looking at his perspective so much harder because it's his expectation that manifests the yielding. So I'm going to continue. Um, I'm going to skip to verse, let's go to, let's go to verse 11. And I'm going to sit on the scripture for a minute. So um, there's a lot of things to break down in this lot. He showed me in this one verse. So just bear with me in this one. Uh, in verse 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And I've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender and of tender mercy. In this, God had me really write, write down one thing, and then he elaborated on all of it. So he had me write down the second part where he said, see, um, see the end of the Lord. In that verse where it says, ye have heard the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. God took me to another way of looking at it. Of course, in that whole story of Job, you know that in the beginning of Job, where he's going through that trial, that, that terrible trial is going through, you see, you see the beginning of it is all Job, right? The beginning of that is all Job. It's his perspective. It's him speaking. It's, it's his cry out to God. Is how he's receiving things and spitting it back up, right? But towards the end of Job's story, you see the end of the Lord because at the end, the Lord shows up and speaks to Job. The Lord comes in and gives Job answers and responds to Job. God is giving his perspective towards the end. So what God was showing me is that, of course, a lot of times in the beginning of a trial, we get to speak, right? We get to shout, we get to cry out, we get to say, oh Lord, this isn't fair. This is going this way, that way, this way, that way. We get to share our perspective of any trial or tribulation we're going through, right? Then towards the end of that trial or whatever it may be, we always tend to see God's perspective in it towards the end. It's like God gets to have his, his last say so in it. But it's not just to say, oh, here's what I have to say, but here's my perspective of what you went through. And through that perspective, it is clarity and just like it's the end of the Lord. Towards the end of every season, you only see the husbandman. It always happens that way. And of course, in the beginning, if you choose to, 
but it just depends. But always towards the end of any season or any type of trial or just like the same thing Job is going through or went through in that time, towards the end, you see where God was doing greater things. You see where God had a bigger, bigger everything in all of it. Um, but I'm going to continue from there. So in my notes, I put, see, see the end of the Lord. And then from there, I wrote this whole uh, breakdown of the paragraph I wrote. So it says, fruit that Job bared was something of a great patience for Job, yet through great trial, he manifested the fruit he was supposed to. So you wouldn't think that Job would bear this kind of fruit in a season of that type of uh, environment where he's got boils growing on his skin. He's got Satan who stripped him of his of his daughters. Satan entered into his wife and told him to pretty much forget and die. Why don't you just let go of God? You know, he had such a oppression and suppression from so many different areas that even when he talked about his own pain, his own suffering, it was fruit. Because isn't something that what he understood his pain and his sorrow brought him down to his real stature. He says we're like maggots before the Lord. That type of sorrow and pain was a fruit he bared, but yet it was only through that type of trial. There was a depth he reached and a manifestation he spoke from all that pain and suffering that could only have happened in that season, right? So back to where my notes continue, it says, God was, God was patient for the preparation of the tree or Job. Before Job got put into this trial, he was prepared as a one with a hedge of protection around him. One who, who sold out his life and everything he had for God. That was his preparation. And many people would see that as like, oh, okay, well, he's been exalted or just established as a true believer to that level. That's not preparation, that's fulfillment. People would say that's fulfillment, right? Because he's fulfilled. He has reached that, that saintly level of, wow, this man, even acknowledged by the Father to Satan, was so holy and devoted. That's, that's, a, that's an achievement to us. For God, it was, but I believe it also was a preparation, God said. So when it comes to you growing in Christ, always understand that you're always growing, but it's not an accomplishment in your growth. It's sometimes pre preparation to bear the fruit. Plants don't just grow. They have to grow to a certain state to bear the fruit, right? This is the same way with Job. He was growing. He was being established to bear this fruit. It's kind of backwards. But further in my notes, I say, um, but his fruit was meant to be bared in a turbulent time. A man who had a hedge of protection that Satan couldn't touch, who watched him from a distance, a man who had daughters, a wife, who... who had all his everything before the Lord, that even when he had everything stripped, he still praised God. A man with that kind of heart was meant to bear some of the best fruit he could ever bear in a, in a turbulent time. It's very backwards. I mean, I know that as, as believers, we don't want to think that. We don't want to think that, wow, I've been searching, seeking the Lord so much. I've been focusing on the Lord so much. I've been, I have been at least in, your, in our own eyes, we're giving everything to him. Why would I have to bear everything I've stored now to be applied in a turbulent time? But that's the best place. It was, that was his ordained spot, okay? Um, further in my notes, I say, his test was not a test in peace, but in a shaking. When... When a, okay, Lord, I'll go with that analogy. I just saw that. When you have a tree that is growing up really strong and you see it, right, from the outside, not underneath the ground, and you see how this tree is doing, is, is doing really well 
from the um, surface above, which you can see. It seems like if you were to see Job as a tree, you'd be like, man, this tree is great, it's strong, it doesn't need anything. Why would you put this, this tree through a test? Why would you need to make sure it's okay? It's because God sees the roots where we don't see. God sees the depth where we don't see. And even though we can look on the outside through our eyes and see like, why would this happen to someone like that? And why would you test someone like that? It's because God saw the roots of Job and he sees the roots of you and me. And he says he can handle it. He can take it. It is for him to have what I have established manifest. It's the application process. The application process is always a type of test. So for something of, of Job, for something of that kind of man to be that strong in the Lord, it, it only makes sense in the way God is seeing it for it to be tested, for it to be exposed and tried in something. Um, not for the destruction, but for the reinforcement, for the declaration of what God did. A part of why God did this to Job and why we may be going through trials or seasons or whatever may go in your life is because God is declaring something. He's, de he's declaring his work in you. How much greater is it to declare his work in you than put you through like an epic movie, put you through something where he gets to showcase you to you than showcase you of him, where he gets to showcase himself to you. How about doing both of those and killing two birds with one stone? Of course, Job has seen the greatness of God. He had had the beauties of God. He has received so much provision from God because of his faithfulness and his righteousness towards the Lord. How much greater would he see where through another face, another side of God, that is even greater than what he did see? Aren't we always seeking more and more and more and deeper and deeper of God? Oh, we all are, who really love God. Well, what God was doing with Job and what he may be doing with your life and mine is that he's showing a different side of, of himself. But he doesn't want it to be forgotten. And so through showing a different side of the Lord, he, he allows certain things of the enemy to happen. And from this, he is showing himself as a husbandman to us. Because he gets to see he gets to show you what he had finished and what he has accomplished in you. Many times we don't know how, how strong we are, what's really in us until we're put through something. That goes exactly the same way with the Lord. He loves to showcase himself through us and he loves to reveal himself and also reveal us of who we really are. We're his children. It's supposed to be like that. Um, Further in what I said was, just to kind of keep going, is that once again, his test was not a test in peace, but it was in a shaking, one of the opposite things you would think of. As this was a season, sorry, I said that this was a, a season he was ordained in of a great yield of fruit. This was the season where he yields some of the greatest fruit he ever yielded in his life was through this turbulent time, okay? The enemy played into the best part of his harvest by God. That was one other thing he had me add, is that we as sponges that received life to produce God's fruit of course, the enemy can't have that. And so he tries to destroy, kill, still and destroy. We know how he works. Through that, God decided to take and use the enemy and manifest an even greater yield. Okay. Don't think that when the enemy comes in waves and in floods, it's because God isn't there. God is right there with you. And of course, it always has to be allowed for it to happen. When it comes to us bearing fruit, we can always expect that someone's going to try to kill and steal and destroy it, which of course the enemy is because it's God's bearing it through you. God is bearing it through you. 
Furthermore, when it comes to Job and how it connects to us, is that he moved in a way where even through the trials and everything, he became even more of a broken contrite spirit that we didn't see. For example, when you and I have probably seen that really, really strong person in Christ who is like, man, that person is so strong in God. And you may have seen them go through something that really, it really just tested everything they had. It, it hit that chord of them that you saw them break down, right? Just like Job, I'm sure Job's friends wouldn't have seen or thought that Job would break down as much as he did, but the trial tested him that much. I know that from my own life, and I'm sure that many other people, when they have witnessed someone going through this type of trial, turbulent time, that you've seen another fruit bared out of them. Haven't you seen another fruit bared out of you when you're going through a trial and turbulent time? Isn't it a more of a, it's a unison with God, it's a lessons that are spitting out from God. Usually when you're going through a trial, you have so many lessons that when you're clinging to God through it, you learn, you understand, you see, and you produce. There's many times where <laughs> when you're going through a trial and turbulent time, God tells you to pray for others. He says for you to stay in prayer and pray for everyone else as well. This type of desire and, and decree from the Lord many times is because the fruit you're going to bear from those types of prayers you're in in that state are going to manifest greater yieldings than what you would have if you weren't in that state. Do you understand that God puts you in certain situations for you to bear his fruit? And it may be in situations you would never think of. So it's about seeing the perspective of God because if he's in all control of everything, then it's only to see what he is seeing. Because if we look through a glass darkly, you're only guaranteed a dark look. You're only guaranteed something where you see it for a little bit and it's not fully clear. That is what we look through. We can't we can't depict five seconds from now. We can try, but I'm guarantee you won't get it right 100 percent of the time. But I'm gonna continue. And I'm yeah, like I said, guys, we're still on verse 11. We're still on that same verse. So, once again, just to go back into my notes and reread and keep going. Because there's one more part God wants me to share. I'm going to say this. His test was not a test in peace, but in a shaking. His fruit wasn't meant to be bared in peace. It was meant to be bared in shaking. That was or his ordained season of a great yield of fruit. Job's, right? Now you see where the patience of the husband comes in. Because a lot of times when we're in trials, when we're in turbulent times, we're wanting to end quickly. But then we just see God be so patient in it. And we wonder why, God, why are you so patient in this season where I'm going through this? Why are you so patient? Shouldn't this be over by now? Shouldn't you have taken care of this? Shouldn't this be done with? Why am I still, why am I still here? He's waiting for the full yield of your fruit. He's still waiting. He's saying, I'm going to be patient because I know what the fruit I'm going to bear through you. I know what this is going to do for you, for the people around you, for me and your relationship. I know. So I am going to be patient because I'm king and no one tempts the Lord. He doesn't he doesn't answer to nobody but himself. And he chooses to respond when he wants to. So he's being patient for a reason in these seasons, guys, is to yield that fruit that you need to bear. And some are and some are, I don't know. That's not my business. I'm looking at my own life too with these, with these Bible studies. <laughs> um, So understand this is why you may hear God be so quiet. You know, in the book of Job where he spoke, God didn't speak until the very end after Job had said everything he could say. 
after Job had been ridiculed by his friends who were on his side, who weren't on his side, who did speak well in a situation, who made a situation worse. God waited until everything was spoken. And then he enters up in the end of that story. Why didn't God show up in the midst of it? Because God was already there in the midst of it. He just wasn't saying much. God waited and was patient because all the things Job said, everything that went through, that fruit was being yielded the whole time. The harvest of Job's great fruit yield was happening. And God was being patient until the end of it. He was waiting for the beginning and end of your latter rain, your fruit bearing. If you look at an apple tree, don't trees, apples fall like rain? Don't they fall like rain? Doesn't it always? Now, how much more falling will you have since we don't just bear one flavor of apples? You can think about it. Don't we? We can bear a known amount of flavor of apples or different types of fruits. So think about the yielding God is doing through you. Think about that analogy and apply it to your life. Why is God being so patient in this? Why is he not? Why is this not being delivered? Why is this not happening? Why am I going through this? The reason is, is because he's fully doing his perfect plan in you. He's looking at you and saying, yes, you have been prepared to be going through this turbulent time or this shaking for a reason. You have fruit to bear that people need to eat from. You have something that is in you that I only see because you look through a glass darkly, even in yourself. Even in yourself, you look through a, a, a glass darkly. So since God sees a perspective clear through you and to you, it is up to him to finish his purpose in you. It's not for us because we can't fully complete it. We do incomplete stories all the time. We complete incomplete stories of us in our description of us. Try to describe yourself. I bet you won't get it perfect. I bet you'll stop at some point and say, I don't know what else to say. It's an incomplete story of yourself. There's your own evidence of you seeing through a glass darkly. God sees it perfectly through you, in you, and around you. So he sees, I see you clearly. And even in this turbulent time where it may feel well, I know what you're bearing and I know the ripple effect you're causing. And I'm going to continue in this time with you and be right there with you and keep you going through this time because the fruits you're bearing are priceless. They're precious and people are being blessed who would never be blessed if you didn't go through this with me. It's his perspective, guys. It's his perspective because he's the one coming back to look at you with expectation as a husbandman, as a farmer, a vine dresser, to say, okay, where have you yielded what I asked? I was patient. This is why it goes back to that tree that was cursed. God was patient with that tree. It bared no fruit. It didn't listen to the Lord. And therefore, it was cursed not to bear any because the fruit was going to be corrupt. It wasn't, it wasn't received. It wasn't of God. So, <clears throat> like my notes ended, it says, now, this is the cool part where God will double it and triple your yield without you even involved. The enemy has already been defeated. Jesus has taken away the keys of death from him and won victory redeeming you. There is literally nothing the enemy can really do to you. He just influences you in the wrong direction. That's all he can do. He is literally powerless. His power over you is ridiculously low. It's only when we give him attention and give him space. He may come as a flood. He has to come five different directions because he has no power, but you have way more that can overcome him. So God uses him as a chess piece. Simple. And in this, of course, in the book of Job, it talks about where in my notes, I put it, let me say this. The enemy was played into the best part of his harvest by God. The enemy thought he was going to break down this man to nothing and that this man was going to just fully reject God in his own words. But God said, OK, cool, you can try because God had prepared Job. God saw through Job clearly even things Job didn't see of himself. And so God set up Job for the 
perfect yield of something astronomical. And of course, Satan didn't see it and Job didn't see it, of course, but God did. So God allowed the enemy to touch Job even through trials that he was already receiving enough. Haven't you read that story? It's like, man, I feel like this guy's received enough already, Lord. But another wham keeps hitting him. Another tribulation hits him. Something else happens. Something else happens. I mean, he gets a flood against him when it's like, this is overbearing just to read. It's crazy what he went through. But more and more and more and more got taken away from him. This type of reality is because God... <laughs> was also pruning him. What the enemy thought was his defeat for Job was God using to prune him for even greater fruit. The enemy took away his daughters. Of course, that's in God's hands because God is the one who gives and takes away life. So even though the enemy killed his daughters, I'm sure they're in heaven. The enemy took away all his flock, everything, all his finances, everything got stripped. He was laid naked, pretty much. And then his skin got put boils. He had boils on his skin that bursted. And he had to sit in this for over a week. This wasn't a day-long judgment. This was over a week or so. He was going through this for days, looking like a dead man. Of course, the enemy is like, man, I got him. I got him. God has messed up and let me touch this man too much. God said, you just did my work for me. You did an act. You, you set me up for an even bigger yield than what could have been. So understand when the enemy is in your life and he is just raging, when he is just sending everything he can, uh, seek the Lord on it and pray about it and understand what is God's perspective in this. Because the enemy, enemy may be trying to destroy you, but God may be using it to prune you for a bigger yield. You see, God may be using the enemy to prune you of a greater yield. Think about if, if Job's daughters were there through that whole time he was going through that terrible, terrible, just sickness and just de deconstruction of him. How would his mind be different in praying to God in that scripture we read for thousands of years now? How much different would things have been if he wasn't stripped as he was or pruned? God had it all figured out, guys. So look at your own life. Let me. I look at my own life in this and say the same thing. God has this figured out. God has this figured out. So I'm going to go in my notes. I put <clears throat> God always in all caps has checkmate over your life. Think about it. God always has checkmate over your life. He must be in one accord with him. You must be in one accord with him. Knowing he has, is, and will continue to make the right moves. This is a, this is a, from the character of God, you have to just say this is a guarantee. If you're in one accord with the Lord, if you are drawing from the Lord, if you're in Christ and Christ is in you and he is yielding fruit through you, this, this has to be perfected in you. God doesn't have a bad resume. God's track record is priceless and perfect. There is no spot in it. So if God has a perfect track record, what is he doing through you? Same thing. God, it says that God never changes. He's yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Same. So his record is the same. So don't let the enemy speak. Don't let him utter anything to you. Only declare God's fulfillment of you through making even the enemy a pawn for you. God didn't make an enemy a pawn for Job for in the enemy. It really wasn't to show the enemy much of anything. If you look back at that story, God was so focused on Job that he was like, all right, enemy, come here, I'm gonna use you. 
You see how great and how massive and how grand God is? It's, it's so, so perfectly focused on his people. God is so perfectly focused on his children in, in ways we can't even figure out. In ways we can't even see ourselves in that God sees us in. This is why we get put through things. It's like, why am I going through this? Because God sees something in you that you can't even see of yourself, even if you try to. And I'm going to continue. So we're finally going to move to the next verse, guys. Um, but let me finish this one thought that I wrote down. I said, sometimes you're being prepared to produce your biggest yield of fruit in a shaking, just like Joe. It goes back to the woman who was giving birth. A woman in travail. What kind of fruit is that? You think about that? You're about to bear a life to live a life fully out of your body. But it causes some of the worst pain and the worst travail you can have in your life. How can you produce fruit from the Lord, but yet it be so terribly painful? You see, but wasn't it the right season for that child to be born in your life? Wasn't your son or daughter the right time? Wasn't it? Or they wouldn't be here. Whether it be premature, postmature, or at the right time where the nine months is supposed to happen. It was still God's time for it. That type of fruit is one of the biggest examples where it's like, man, I was in this shaking, but man, what came out of it was the biggest blessing I ever had. Hasn't many people said that about their own children? That was the, this, this is the, this is my gift from God. But yet it was a fruit bared from you. So there, this whole scenario that God is painting and having me share with you doesn't just show you about how important it is to, to yield the fruit and be in one accord with God, but in preparation. There's so much in the preparation process of a tree getting to that moment where it's like, all right, I have an pollen. I'm at the strongest part of me. I'm, I'm at that prime to bear this fruit and the fruit begins to bear, right? Isn't there so much growth prior to that? Doesn't the apple tree have to be at a certain stature before it can start bearing apples? So the preparation process, us getting in with God, us being in that fellowship with the Lord, us having that communion with him, us having him as our application process every day, every moment. This is preparation for the next thing because we always have to see God as a forward moving God. He is, he is yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the past, present, and future. He tells us to look forward and move forward with no blind with blinders like this, like a horse. Why does the scripture say this and not look back? It's because he is moving forward. He has a place for us to go. And if we're going places, just like if you're preparing to go somewhere else, you got to prepare yourself, right? You prepare yourself to get in the car, to go drive down the street. You got you to make sure you got your keys, your gas, your money, whatever it is you're preparing. God is moving in a locomotive way and he moves through us in motion. That's what his Holy Spirit is. It's his breath, right? This type of move and flow is something that always requires preparation. You're always being prepared for the next season. You're always being prepared for the next season. This is why we're finishing a race. The race to finish to the finish line. This is why. I'm going to continue. Um, I'm going to go to verse 13. So verse 13, it says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. These scriptures... God showed me, and I'm just going to read from what my notes said. He showed me that through these turbulent times, come as you are. If you're going through this season and it's that terrible, don't try to be the mantra man like I got this, I got this. 
Be a Job where you're crying out saying, I'm a maggot before you, Lord, help. The turbulent time you're going through when you're bearing this fruit, or maybe a peaceful time, it doesn't always have to be turbulent. It is to come as you are to the Lord through it all. Like Job did, God knows, God knows you may not understand. This is a true thing that God understands when he's using you, when he's bearing fruit through you, just like a tree doesn't know. God knows you may not understand, but this is the kicker. Since God knows that you don't understand, and since you are coming to him in singing songs through your season, if you need to, in crying out in your season, if you need to, and asking for prayer and asking for help and, and, and whatever it is, you're coming as you are in that season. As you're doing that, the next thing you have to understand is I have to keep yielding. Even though I'm going through this, I have to keep yielding the fruit. I have to keep producing. I have to keep bearing this because I'm called to. I was never called to stop. So to elaborate on what I'm saying, I might notice I put, when a tree bears fruit in its season, it doesn't think about the possible things that can happen while, it, while it's happening. It's just bearing fruit without restraint, despite possible weather changes, despite any other, other obstacles, any type of bugs eating it, locusts coming. A tree doesn't just say, oh, man, I don't know about the season. I feel like locusts are coming to eat my fruit. I'm not going to do it. No, a tree just continually bears even in a storm, even in the wintertime, even if the weather is not perfect for it. It keeps going, but yet it's vulnerable to the Lord. You see the correlation of who and what we're supposed to be is and how Job was, even though he was he still kept crying out to God and kept bearing the same fruit he did. He never stopped. He was vulnerable to God. He didn't say, oh man, I'm gonna close off because I'm going through this. No, he opened even more up to the Lord. He opened up even more to God, but he still kept yielding because he knew, well, I'm not in control of this. My environment is changing. I've lost my daughters, my cattle are gone, but he still kept yielding. This is a time where it feels okay when you're going through something on oh, so over. I'm just going to just, I'm going through too much. But God calls you to say, no, keep yielding this fruit. I got this. Keep yielding. You're not seeing what I'm doing fully. You're not seeing the whole season. You're not seeing where these storms of weather are making bigger fruits than they could have. When they could have, when without that storm, the fruit was this big, but because the storm of fruit is yielded this big each time. There's different levels of it too, and there's greater things God has for you that he can do through you, through shakings, through storms, through sunny days, through unhappy days. Like, it is us to keep going. The locomotive mentality, the forward no type of blinders that you need. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, I put that... <clears throat> Don't let whatever that may be oppressive go unheard by the Lord while you're bearing fruit. Whatever is oppressing you, don't let it go unheard. God says, come to my throne, my mercy seat, as a son and daughter, with confidence. God knows. Remember, God knows. We see through a glass darkly, but he sees clearly. So he knows what we're going through. It's, it's us to fully go heard by the Lord, going through everything. It is for us to be heard. He wants to hear us. He wants to know. He wants to hear it. Because even you being heard, you crying out to God, do you know you're yielding even greater fruit there too? It's a twofold thing. And I'm trying not to get to my head and myself because I'm going to get to that scripture in a second where he showed me that. But let me just finish this one uh, uh, commentary I did, uh, this one thing I wrote down. I said, speak cry out. This in itself bears even more fruit because the deepening of your relationship is established, which is growthful type fruit. You bearing 
this type of fruit where you're deepening your relationship. And we have all been there where you're just like, Lord, I need you every moment. Right. Of course, we need them every moment. But we know when to consciously like you're, you're, you're you have white knuckles because you're just holding God's hand so hard. It's that white knuckle mentality. Right. That type of establishing that deeper relationship establishes a fruit in you of growth. It's a growth fruit. You're not really bearing it for other people or whatever around you. You being heard through this time with everything you got, with every little sentence, period, exclamation mark, and question mark, you being heard, however you write it and get it out to God, is literally starting a fruit in you where you grow. How many trees really grow in the same season they bear fruit? Usually you don't really notice the growth of a tree while it's bearing fruit, right? When a tree has a lot of apples on it, you don't see how much it grows. You really see how much apples there are. But God sees something even deeper. God shows you, God shows us that we are to be something that is always increasing, going from glory to glory to glory to glory. That is done through one of these methods. Through this turbulent time you may be going in, through this pain you may be going in, through this heartache you may be going in, God is hearing you and he's saying, I'm doing something in you. And, and he's saying that I'm doing something in you that's going to make it even greater once it's all over. Once it's all over, it's going to be even greater. It's a guarantee. Remember God's track record, God's resume. It is priceless and spotless. Remember who our father is, how he has everything ordained. Remember how God is, he has checkmate in every move. Every move he makes in your life is a checkmate of everything around it. He's the king of kings. So, in my notes I put, <clears throat> is growthful type fruit in you with God on top of what you are being growth, growthful of the fruits you're yielding at the same time? So it's like you're doing a supernatural growth in you while bearing supernatural greater fruit than you could have without that trial. And it's a double manifestation of what God wanted. It's like he's doing something so greater than what he could have done without that trial. Now you start seeing where is the enemy? In all of this, where is the enemy at? He's not there. Because you now just see God. You just see God now. So this is the flip point where our mind state, our minds have to be in this another perspective. We can't sit in this dark clouded mindset. We can't see through, we can't sit in this mindset where we see through a glass dark. We don't have to sit there. Paul said it is because that's what happens. But yet Paul got revelation strictly from God that other apostles did it. This is the key to see it in the light God has it. Because once you start seeing it there, the enemy doesn't have much voice anymore. He can't speak as much because he loves to speak in the darkness. The enemy loves to talk in that darkness because he's a coward. He just loves to hide. That's what snakes do. That's what vipers do. That's what scorpions do. They hide and come out and strike and go back. That's all he is, guys. But I'm going to continue in verse 15. And maybe one more verse and wrap it up. So in verse 15, it says, let me see. Yep. And the prayer of, the, of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven of him. Now, I'm sure many people have thought this. Well, dang, I better get it right the first time, right? No. God knows you're going to make mistakes. God knows that fully, and it's not for you to be perfect in your yielding of your season. It's not for you to be perfect in this fruitful season you have. It's not. It's for you to see God perfectly in it. It's for you to see God perfectly in your season. Once that is achieved, and once you start seeing him more and more, the mistakes, of course, from the beginning, 
through repentance and forgiveness and just what who we are are already taken care of. Remember, he makes a checkmate move every time he does something in your life. He is faithful to you even when you're not. So never think of this perfection type lifestyle. Please remove that. I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> I've tried to do that. It is a it's a bad path to go in. You only get distressed and anxiety because you can't do it. So always know you're going to make mistakes. If you read Job's story, he made a little bit of mistakes too, didn't he? But at the same time, where did God show up? The same way. Even with Job's mistakes, God showed up the same way way. It didn't flinch to God. That God didn't flinch and say, oh no, I didn't see that coming. He knew. He knew. He knew it fully. So I'm going to continue going to verse 18 and we're going to close it out. So in verse 18, it says, and he prayed again, talking about Elijah. No, let me read 17 just so you get the whole thing. 17 and 18. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Right? 18. He prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I've read this many times, and I've never been taken to this level or this route where God took me. So I'm trying to explain it the way he brought it to me. So, in my notes, I'll put it, if, if Elijah could pray for a whole landmass, he prayed for a whole landmass not to have rain for three and a half years. Do you, know how lot, do you know how much rain that is kept? That's a lot in a landmass. For three and a half years, it didn't rain. It had no rain or fruit. And with, and with prayer, the earth gave fruit. With simple prayer, that's all it was. God simply, God gave Elijah his answer through simple prayer. It wasn't like he prayed 10, 15 times and it finally happened. Got, uh, Elijah got fed up and said, let there be no rain for three and a half years. I can't quote it, of course, but you understand where he's going with it. This is something to apply to us. I'm sure that some people want to know, how do I bear fruit, Lord? How do I do it? If you want to bear fruit, just simply ask. Just simply ask, Lord, I want to bear fruit. I want to bear your fruit, Lord, orchestrated through me. Help me be in one accord so I can bear your fruit through me. It's done. Now, but be prepared how God does it, though. Be prepared and how God does it. When you pray for this, walk in faith and watch. It may happen the same day. It may happen the next day. It may happen five months from now. But watch. But in also doing this, when you're praying for fruit to be bared, I, I was writing this down last night, and it's like I saw the different layers of what else you need to pray for. God was showing me, when you want to pray for fruit, simply pray it like Elijah prayed for no rain. You just simply pray and walk by faith. He was a man just like us, right? God also had me write down, pray for preparation. Pray for it. If you wanted to pray for fruit, well, how can you bear fruit without preparation to bear it? He then had me, pray, had me say, pray for deep roots. Because if God may put you through a peaceful time or a shaking time or a turbulent time, do you know your roots are still growing deeper? Do you know your roots can get stronger and fatter and wider no matter what? So it's greater to pray for your roots. It's great because from there you can draw from the source easier. With weak roots, you can't really suck up the source. Jesus, right? You really can't, but with th thick roots, Great roots, you certainly can. So if your desire is to bear fruit, another thing that God had me write down is pray for the environment God would want you to bear fruit in. Pray for the environment that God would want you to bear fruit in. Because in the end, we're looking at his perspective, right? It's not ours. 
We see through a glass darkly so we can say, oh, Lord, how about I bear fruit in this setting? This would be a perfect setting to bear fruit, wouldn't it? God may say yes, but he may say, I have a better idea. You know, so it's better to pray for this environment. You can pray for that. There's no limits. Come to him as you are. If you're like, Lord, I want to bear fruit. Please prepare me. Please deepen my roots. Please make the environment for me to do it. And the last thing I've had to put down that God showed me is pray for your soil to be without weeds interfering or draining you. Pray for your soil to be without weeds, of course, crabgrass, whatever you want to see. I know people who are more of a botanist and who watch these know exactly what's going on. Pray for your soil to be without things that could drain it. There's times where you can have things that don't have to be there. You don't have to have certain things around you. God is the God of all things. He is God of a deliverer. He's your redeemer. He's your protector. He's your shield. I can the list goes on, guys. We all know that, right? So pray that there is nothing interfering from you bearing your fruit. Nothing that is siphoning your life or your source or drawing your attention away from the source to bear the fruit that he's calling you to do in that season. And watch it be removed. Watch a different setting happen when you pray this. Because all it takes is prayer. And all it takes is you understanding. Now, oh, that's so good, Lord. Thank you. As a husbandman, you see it in his perspective. God wants to set you up in the right environment. God wants to set you up with no weeds. God wants to set you up with deeper roots. God wants to set you up in preparation. And God wants to set you up to bear fruit. Just as a husband would, husbandman would expect to start farming. A farmer wants to have the, the right environment despite whatever storm comes, whatever winds come, whatever oppression comes as far as his crops. He still wants to have the environment ready because he knows it may come. God knows. So it's only right for us to look at the perspective of a husbandman and pray according to what a loving agape love father would ask. This is a perspective we, we including myself, need to look into, into what God has for us and how we should walk in bearing what he wants. We, can, we have declaration over many things, but we just don't apply it. We have declaration in Jesus' name and authority over many things. We just don't apply it because one thing we don't know, and we're not seeing it the way he is seeing it. We're trying to see things through a glass darkly. How about we just pray for God's perspective? So even though we see through that glass darkly, we can receive revelation. We can receive wisdom. We can receive insight. We can receive sight better. Okay? So guys, this is the Bible study. Once again, he had me title it, The Patience of the Husbandman. And as we look at through this Bible study, you see the perspective of what he wants. So guys, I love y'all. Take this video. Give it to the Lord. Hope it helps you in your studies and your walk with Christ. And um, I'll see you in the next one. I'll see y'all later. Bye.